here at 5G World. Um, in the early morning, a lot of sessions were about 4G. <laughs> uh, we have one session right now about 5G. Does that mean that the critical communications in industry is just as slow or just as fast as they always are? Good timing. I just arrived here at London City Airport. It's only five minutes with a bus. so many different opinions and ideas about how critical communication should look like in the future. Uh, to me it looks like something that is really very difficult to put the right finger on the right. So as you all know I'm sure the main thing about Hackathon is the experience. Jason Trimmer, Katjan Wolf, but Jason Trimmer from Heathrow Airport. Now, Jason, you have sitting, you sat down here for two hours, I believe, almost two hours of very interesting information about the future of critical communications. Go to a situation where you will be working with multiple technologies instead of one communication technology. Yeah. So does that mean you think we're going back to where a lot of companies and organizations have been in the past? That's a really good question. So as you know, we're uh, implementing Tetra as replacements for our 20-year-old analog uh, MPT 327 network. And we have three or four, four other radio technologies too. Um, so we want to move those out of the way and, and just have a, a Tetra platform for operation and, and commercial um, uh, end users. Uh, and of course, that's narrowband data communications and, and voice communication. So uh, we need to think long term as well. So uh, my interest mainly here at 5G World is to understand uh, mission critical services uh, potentially be used with 5G. Uh, enterprise networks. Besides Tetra? In parallel with Tetra, I think in the future, I think Tetra, especially at Heathrow, uh, it will be the cornerstone of our public safety. Um, but, uh, I mean, it operates still over voice, uh, and uh, the firefighters need a reliable uh, communication platform. We have regulatory uh, uh, mandation from uh, the Civil Aviation Authority to provide reliable voice service, so it's a voice service uh, a kilometre past the end of the runway uh, and without uh, that reliable radio service uh, our, our mandate to operate as, a, as a, an aerodrome our licence will be taken away so Heathrow wouldn't exist. So voice communication for Heathrow is very very fundamental. But that's secured, that's regulated, that's, every, that's okay. That's great. We're looking now into data, we're now yeah. looking into the future technologies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and with all of the frequencies that will become available or not, or the commercial operators that can provide the service uh, or not, because you know they have to uh, apply to many rules that you guys would like to have, of course, being, being organized, because you need to have that this dedicated bandwidth all the time. Uh, absolutely. And Some Heathrow. challenges there, probably, yeah, as yeah. well. Heathrow, West End of London, uh, very compli complex uh, radio ecosystem, probably one of the busiest ecosystems for spectrum in the country. Um, we have our own systems, we have, uh, you know, it's the West of London, we've got mobile services, we've got radar, we've got all sorts of uh, spectrum from right down at the end of, uh, you know, um, ILS, which operates right down in, in the shortwave band, all the way up to um, uh, operating uh, radar to pick up um, foreign object debris on the runway. That's up to 28 gig, so it's very, very complex. Um, for us, Heathrow, uh, as an operator, uh, we need that command and control function. So we would rather operate our radio platforms ourselves. Um, it's very important to us. We've seen um, airlines fall over in the past. Um, security is very important. We've, we've seen the DDoS attacks. So uh, for us, carving out spectrum for ourselves, 5G maybe. Um, for instance, spectrum sharing.
Something slicing some way, some way, shape or form could be an option. Is it not very difficult to pick and choose the right technology, combining this right technology together with all the technology you're using already? Because you have so many flavors at the moment. Yes, we do. So we, we do look at how potentially Tetra and LTE could be combined, a hybrid platform in the future. So maybe we'll just go Tetra uh, and then, you know, maybe in a few years' time we'll watch all the potential mistakes being made because we don't want to implement something that we have to, you know, that is huge technical data or delta, should I say, to get it back there Are you again. looking to the mistakes which are happening, which could happen? Well, let me say yeah. mistakes could, but could happen on, on ESN or at first half, for example, because those networks are the first actually to adopt broadband technology next to their uh, mission critical voice. Yeah, that's right. So um, I think for us it's understanding the capex that's involved. We're, we're a 12 kilometer square site, we're a, a small city, we transport pubs, retail, hotels. Of course we've got the operation around the, the, the airlines, we've got 80 airlines. We have to make sure that what we implement, because it does take time, um, that is fit for purpose. And we have to have that, that vision, that strategic vision in the future in order to make sure that five or ten years down the line, it still suits our needs. Motorola solutions at Critical Communications World, where you could wear this Oculus uh, virtual reality glass and then with the blink of your eye um, um, activate people or systems. And this is virtual reality on the scene of a crime. Five years ago, when we talked about using Bluetooth in devices for public safety and police, well, people would say to you, you're crazy, it's not secure, we're not going to use it. But nowadays, we are even thinking about using, we're thinking, we use virtual reality in our training. That's right, is it? That's correct, yes. Virtual reality and IoT in training, yep. and that's going to be used also in the future in in real scenarios, right? Definitely, yes. Okay. Well, so what, what do you guys are doing? You know, well, in, in Leicestershire Fire and Rescue Service, we're, we're doing two, two projects. One we're using 360 degree filming, which is our educational side for educating new drivers to keep them safe. And the second project is we're using the virtual reality uh, training environment to train fire investigators and police scenes of crime. Um, we've got them both here today. That one is uh, the virtual reality it's room scale and it's photo realistic so when you're in there it's not like being in a gaming world it is so real and with it being real people stay switched on because it's training it's reaccreditation um it's great enthusiasm it's, as well oh, isn't it it's, yeah it's, people don't want to sit in the classroom and be taught so cool. Um, it really looked like I'm in that situation, picking up things, understanding, you know, um, what's going on. Um, something really necessary for each fire brigade to train on, and at a later stage, use similar technology into whatever, into a really burning house where the commanding officer can exactly see what the fireman is doing from from an outside point of view, from a command central point of view. Tony, we are here at 5G World. Um, in the early morning, a lot of sessions were about 4G. <laughs> Uh, we have one session right now about 5G. Does that mean that the critical communications in industry is just as slow or just as fast as they always are? No, not really. I think uh, the point is that we haven't yet finished doing 4G. So, you know, to be looking ahead to 5G feels a bit strange from the environment we've come from of just having Tetra and P25 and LMR for so many years. You know, suddenly we're on this roller coaster of G's. <laughs> it, it feels a bit strange to us. But the, the, the content of today has been great in the sense that, as you say, we saw and heard and talked a lot about 4G and where that's taking us in critical communications and the need for additional work and additional 
uh, effort on the functionality that 4G will deliver for us, but then to have the sort of visionary uh, session that we had here at the end with William Webb and, and Peter Clemens and the other great guys really tells us that this industry of ours, this public safety critical communications world, is seriously thinking ahead now into, okay, we can do 4G, we know we can do that. And in, in different ways. Time. In, different in the future, it's going to be 5G, but as was clearly pointed out, it's an evolution, not a revolution. So and the awareness is now there, right? Yeah. And, and that's most important, the awareness of 4G and the different solutions, the challenges also they have to overcome in tenders for the future, yeah. spectrum challenges and so on. It's yeah. now aware, everybody's aware of that, so yeah. again, they can start working on it yeah. and then thinking about 5G. Yeah, and you know, I have users, just the ordinary Joe policeman or whoever, who actually has to use and rely on this stuff, coming to me and saying, what's this 5G? Why are we talking about 5G? We haven't even done 4G. We just started working with Tetra. Yeah, but it's an evolution and, you know, people are concerned unnecessarily in my, my estimation that uh, we'll put a lot of work into 4G and that'll all be lost and gone because suddenly it'll be 5G. For me, it's the end of the day. Um, I must say, I've seen a lot of new, exciting things. And uh, once you think you're there, you've seen it all, it's just the starting point of a new adventure in critical communications world. Much to see, much to happen. I'm looking forward to next year's Tech Week. And with that, I close the vlog.